Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Valerie Ekman. I am the Director of Curriculum for Interborough School District. I also help to oversee the district's pre-K counts and Title I programs. So we're really excited to have so many kindergarten and pre-K parents turn out tonight for the topic of helping little people with their big feelings. I have a few little people of my own, and I know I'm super excited to turn, tune into this, not only for professional reasons, but also for my personal reasons as well. Um, I just wanted to address a few things about a webinar in case you've never participated in a Zoom webinar before. Um, I know Zoom can be a little bit intimidating, but please know that we actually cannot see your faces or screens on Zoom through the webinar format. So all we can see is that you have signed or that you're here as a participant. So we can't see your faces, your screens, what's happening in your own houses, neither can any of the other participants. Um, you'll see a few features at the bottom of your Zoom screen. One is a Q&A and one is a chat. Um, the Q&A is an area that is available for others to see. So if you ask a question, which we certainly encourage you to do throughout the presentation, not only can the host see it, but the other members of the public can see it as well. The chat is private and only the panelists who I'll be introducing shortly can see that. So as we're talking tonight, if you don't mind, we would like in the chat section, if you can put your name and your child's name and the school that they attend. Again, that will be your name, your child's name and the school that he or she attends. And that's just for us to have um, verification of knowing who is in the room tonight. And also there's some awesome resources that we would like to provide you um, and we'll be sending them home with your students. So we need to know whose parents were represented tonight so we can make sure we get the information to the correct students. Um, with that being said, I do also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded tonight. So we'll be putting this on our district website. If at any time you would like to reference back to it or share it with others, you can feel free to do that. Um, I would like to introduce this evening, Ms. Rachel Lambert. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Rachel Lambert. I'm one of the supervisors of special education here at Interboro School District. I'm very excited for today as we um, in my office particularly deal with little people with big feelings on a daily basis and I'm very excited to see which strategies that we can implement in the classroom as well as then generalize into the home setting. So thank you for attending tonight. And our presenters tonight, who you may recognize, are Ms. Christine Bryan. Um, Christine Bryan is our counselor at the Kindergarten Academy, so she works with our kindergarten and our pre-K students, and Ms. Natalie Tozer, who is our um, counselor at the Tinicum School. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie and Christine. Hi, everyone. We're so happy you could join us tonight. All right, so I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, again, my name is Christine Bryan, and I am the counselor at the Kindergarten Academy. I work with the district's kindergartners as well as our pre-K students. This is my fourth year as school counselor at the Kindergarten Academy, but it's my 10th year actually with Interboro School District. Um, I love the district. It's a great place to work and be. Uh, before I was the counselor, I spent six years as a special education teacher at the Kindergarten Academy. And prior to that, I spent seven years as a special education teacher in a special education school. Almost all of my career, I have worked with the littlest uh, students. I've worked with ages four through 21, but mostly most of my career has been with four, five, and six-year-olds. Um, also, I'm the parent of two boys. I have two sons. Uh, one is 13, and one is almost 15. And so you'll hear Ms. Tozer and I speak tonight not just as you know counseling professionals but also to you as parents we are where you are we have been where you are so um hopefully you you know we can relate to you and you can relate to us as we parent and work with your children in the school environment thank you mrs brian um I'm Natalie Tozer. I'm the school counselor at Tinicum. That's been mentioned already. Um, I actually grew up in Prospect Park, so I am from the community and I attend a Prospect Park school, which was great. And it's, I have to say now that Prospect is my second favorite school now that I've been at Tinicum for so long. 
Um, I worked at the high school prior to coming to Tannicum School, and I really just knew all along that I loved working with the younger learners. Um, so I feel like I have it the best of both worlds. Now we have a kindergarten in our building, and I get to work with students all the way up through eighth grade. I also am a licensed professional counselor and work with children and adolescents outside of the school setting. And most importantly, I'm the parent of a seven-year-old daughter and an almost five-year-old son who, as Ms. Bryan said, you'll hear a lot about them as we go through this because we are learning from this ourselves <laughs> and every day through trial and error. So a lot of this is personal experience in addition to um, what we've learned professionally thus far. So hopefully you will find it all helpful. Um, this has already been mentioned a little bit, but if you could please remember to use the chat function to sign in so that those materials can be distributed to you. And if your child is in cyber or sync, then we will make arrangements to get those to you, even if they're not in the building. Um, the resources that you will be receiving include a packet um, entitled Thriving at Home with some great tips and resources, especially considering the pandemic right now and being at home a little bit more. Um, the If Then card set, which we will definitely reference heavily later in the presentation, and a list of children's books um, that we thought would be helpful about feelings and kind of helping manage those big feelings through stories and a little less intense than an actual lesson that they might receive in the classroom, just story time with you. Um, in about 10 to 15 minutes, speaking of story time, there will be a read aloud of one of those books. Um, so if you would like to have your child join you for that part of the webinar, it does last about eight minutes. Just to give you an idea, I know this is a tough time of night, so if you do have to tend to them for a little and want to bring them on at that part, it's great. Um, after that, we will, it will be more um, back to the parent-centered conversation, but we're happy if you'd like them to join for that piece. And we will be monitoring the Q&A, but we will likely be answering those questions at the end so that we can thoroughly go through and make sure that we're not missing anything. So we're hoping that there's several takeaways from this evening. Um, the first one being that we begin to give your child the language and skills that they need in order to help express their emotions accurately and effectively. Um, we also hope to give parents the tools that they need to help deal with strong emotions that are being displayed by your child through active engagement and through um, emotional education. We also plan to discuss the importance of a predictable environment and how routine and consistency can help diminish some problem behaviors. And finally, we're going to explore time in versus time out. So... I'm going to start with a story because this um, was a big motivator for where to start with how to talk about this because this happened to me. This is my, my daughter, Violet, um, who I said she is seven years old. This is her at the dentist's office. Now, she has had quite the history um, at the dentist's office. She's from having to be put under to have cavities filled. She, she really has bad teeth. So please don't feel mad if your child gets cavities because um, dealing with a child who's had about 10 in her life already. So anyway, we were here for a visit to the dentist um, and she got the giggle juice, gas, whatever they use, and they were starting to take care of one of her cavities. And she started screaming and crying and saying, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. So the dentist stopped, the hygienist stopped. I'm there like, you know, trying to calm her down. What hurts, what hurts? It hurts, it hurts, she can't say where, so they're taking things out of her mouth, they're feeling around in her mouth, does this hurt, does that hurt, can you feel this? Everything checks out that there should not be anything actually hurting her. So after several rounds of starting, stopping, and the it hurts and the crying, um, she finally said, I'm scared, like I'm nervous, this feels weird. So. It, it, it took a lot of prompting to get her to that, like us saying, like, there's nothing going on that should be painful, you shouldn't feel this, so, but all she knew how to say was, it hurts, because that was her way of expressing, like, things aren't normal, things aren't right, even though that wasn't the right emotion at the time. So we really think that that is a big piece of what's going on with the little guys, that they, they have a big feeling, but they don't know what it is. Um, so sometimes all they say is it hurts or act upset 
or angry. So this clip here, um, there's a podcast clip you're going to listen to in a moment, is from Dr. Brene Brown. Um, it's in an interview that she did talking about the importance of social emotional learning. Um, you can see here, and you don't need to read all of them, we're not gonna get known into it, but there are numerous core emotions, way more than our children know how to identify in pre-K and kindergarten. But hopefully, you know, once they have some of that education with us and moving forward, their emotionless can grow. So here is a clip just talking about how small children handle naming emotions. you go to the doctor because you have a pain in your shoulder that's so acute that when you feel it you lose your breath you almost pass out I mean it is an acute pain and you get to the doctor's office and she says tell me where it hurts and all of a sudden your hands are tied behind your back and your mouth is duct taped shut and you just say mm, 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 mm. and she's like no I can't I can't help you until you point to it well tell me what hurts mm, mm. that's what happens to us when we're in emotional pain which we know now that emotional pain registers in the brain, the same exact part of the brain as physical pain. So if you pour scalding coffee accidentally on your hand, the same part of the brain lights up as if you feel social rejection or disconnection. Like emotional pain is real. But imagine not being able to point to it or talk about it in a way where you can heal from it or someone can help you because you don't have the language. That's why emotional literacy, um, people like Mark Brackett's work at Yale um, is so important because we've got to learn the language. So if you become familiar with the categories of emotion, with the identifications of various emotions, does that alone enable you to label your own emotion better? Yes, yeah, hundred percent. Because you, you can, you know, Mark Brackett has this. Uh, he, he's an incredible. He's the director of the Emotion Studies. I don't know if that's the formal name, but Emotion Studies at Yale. And he's been he's been fighting his entire career to get emotional literacy, social emotional literacy, in to schools. And they see a huge difference in outcomes for students who have the gift of emotional granularity. Mm. And so emotional literacy is the foundation of resilience, empathy, I think connection. You know, so much of the work that I do and you do is about having the courage to make a bid for connection and having the courage to answer the bid. So as you just heard, I mean, the, the signals sometimes for emotions that kids experience are the same as if we were to get hurt, if you were to spill coffee on yourself. So there's so much work to be done in teaching them how to differentiate between what's really going on. They're just feeling something strong and we need to help teach them and give them the language to express that so they can work through it. So one of the great things about um, having your child in Interboro School District is that we value and the district values social emotional learning as much as we value academics. Um, and, you know, we have a pre-K curriculum. It's called Big Day in Pre-K that built into their curriculum is social emotional themes and learning as well as in the Kindergarten Academy, we use a second step. It's called Second Step. A SEL program and um, that's taught multiple times a week. In addition to that, the kindergartners get guidance lessons and there's groups that are offered to de de excuse me, delve deeper into some social emotional themes or areas that kids are struggling with. Um, we know that in order to make academic progress, we have to have our social emotional health in check and the district really values that. So, um, children at a young age need to be able to name their emotions as well as begin to learn how to manage them. Um, they need to learn how to make friends and be good friends. And they must feel healthy and safe in their environment. They're all priorities um, in our schools and we're really lucky that we address that um, on such a high level. Um, every child 
has all the same emotions and feelings that adults do. Oftentimes, I think that people think little people, little problems or little feelings. However, behavior can really indicate it's much different than that. Kids have powerful emotions, just like adults. At the kindergarten academy, we spend a lot of time talking about those strong and powerful emotions. They just don't always know how to handle these emotions. And that's really what we're here tonight to help discuss and address in a practical how-to way. And just to jump in before we move on to the next slide, the social emotional learning continues on in the community schools, which is wonderful. Um, we have different programs that we use, but we build on the same skills and foundations that they're getting as kindergartners and those guidance lessons and groups. So it, we really are fortunate because I know I've, I've been in other schools and it's not always the focus, but I feel like it is, we are very lucky that it is a big focus here. So we've broken tonight down into some steps and really the first step is um, to address behaviors is establishing predictable routines. So a predictable environment leads to less behaviors in general, but what does that really mean? Um, basically means if kids know what to expect, then they have less fluctuation in their behaviors. Um, if you think about it, it really is the same as adults. I mean, I know for myself, if I start off with a plan for the day and I have an agenda or a to-do list or something like that, then my day tends to be more efficient, more effective, I get more done. If I go to the grocery store and I go with my list, then I get what I need. If I forget my list or I don't have one, I feel more scattered. Um, I forget half the things I'm supposed to be getting. So, you know, it really affects adults the same way. Also with adults, if we think about it, if we have a plan and our plan gets, you know, all zigzagged and it diverges from what we thought the day was gonna be like, that can send our emotions into a bit of a tailspin. We feel more anxious, we feel more restless, we don't know what to expect, um, we feel frustrated because we didn't get things done. So kids feel the same way as we do. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's hard enough on us, it's even harder on them because they don't always have the ability to manage those emotions. So what can we do to help that? We start with a predictable environment. Um, I always say we start small. So bedtime routines are a great way to begin. And I'm gonna put a caveat on this because um, as a parent, I know that this is sometimes way easier said than done. Um, my, you know, growing up when my children were young, my husband worked shift work. So he worked second shift and I did a lot of this by myself, which is, is hard. Um, it can be exhausting. I will tell you that that is usually pretty, a pretty short period of time that you maybe get some pushback from kids or it is you know, exhausting. Once you start to establish those predictable routines and environment, it actually helps make things go a lot smoother. So I say just start on a school night, I'll start on school night. So you know, if you wanna have a looser bedtime routine on the weekends, then that's great. But you know, if Sunday through Friday night or Thursday night, you have the same routine, um, it really, really helps. So um, the number one thing to remember is that bedtime should begin at least 30 minutes before you want your child to go to bed. And another critical part of this is what time should your child go to bed? The American Academy of Pediatrics actually says that kids that are four to six should be getting 11 to 12 hours of sleep a night. And that's a pretty long time, especially if you're waking your kiddo up at 7 a.m. to get ready to go to school or 6 a.m. because they have to get ready to go to daycare or before care. So, you know, thinking back 11 or 12 hours, if your child is waking up at 7 a.m., they should really be ready to sleep by 8 p.m. Um, so wind down time, as I like to call it, or calm down time, starts about 7.30 in order for that to be an effective 8 p.m. target bedtime. Um, building a routine doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's not like you have to do this elaborate bedtime um, you know, routine and, and you know, put on a show. It really can just include the same thing each night. So we do bath time, and then we do teeth brushing, and then we do a quiet story time. Um, the calming activity is really important. And 
you know, again, this is this is easier said than done, but whenever possible, and especially on nights when your child is going to school the next day, excluding technology from the bed or bedroom is really important. If you can start that a couple hours before bed, that is ideal. But again, I know how that goes. You've got dishes to clean up, you have to shower, whatever it is. But sending your child to bed with technology is, um, you know, not ideal, especially on a school night. Reason being is that research shows that when a child has a tablet in front of them in bed or a TV on or a movie going, um, their brain is not able to fully shut down. Yes, they may fall asleep in front of the TV or they may fall asleep with the tablet, but really it take, it's taking them so much longer and they're not falling into that deep level of sleep that they really need. So whenever possible, excluding electronics from the bed or bedtime is ideal. And then after a consistent bedtime is, routine is established, you can try putting other routines in place, making them predictable, such as like the morning routine. Um, it can be, you know, simple two, three, four steps. I get up, I wash my face, I brush my teeth, and I put my, you know, my clothes on. Whatever that is, I eat my breakfast and I go to school. I get my backpack. Um, you know, you can make it pretty simple. Um, the and then you can, you know, move on to after school time, snack time, whatever you feel as though your family would benefit from having a routine for. Okay, step number two is acknowledging and talking about your child's emotion, helping them name that feeling. So if your child is playing and something breaks or they lose in a game, they might, might start to cry or freak out. And a lot of times we use the terms like, you know, you're freaking out, you need to stop, or like he's having a meltdown, or say something like you're so upset right now, but we're not really labeling the feeling or emotion what's going on. So we can take opportunities like to say, you seem really frustrated, you seem to be really mad or angry that you lost. Um, you look sad right now, you're crying, can I help you? And you can do the same thing when they're happy, like, you know, not just say like, oh, great, like you had a good day. Like say, what's something that made you happy? Why was your day so good? Were you happy? Were you excited? So kind of just getting away from like the simple language of the general language, like good, bad, um, freaking out, having a meltdown and labeling it as to what's going on. So they have words to use for that. So now, comes the read aloud. I thought it would be easier than me reading it live for you <laughs> to record myself reading it, but I, I want to put it out there. One, feel free to have your kids join for this part. Two, it is a lift the flat book, so it doesn't flow as nicely as I would have hoped for a regular read aloud, but I did want to show you guys all of the flaps and your kids get to hear as best they could um, exactly what was going on in the story. So here is the story, What Are Feelings? that I thought did a really good job of kind of starting to category, categorize those first feelings and talk about the reasons for those feelings to help kids understand. What are feelings? With the flap, first questions and answers book. What are feelings? Feelings are what we all feel inside our bodies and brains when good or bad things happen to us. Can you guess how these animals are feeling today? I want to sing and dance. I'm so happy. Leave me alone. I'm very angry. I'll come back later when you've calmed down. I need a hug. I'm feeling sad. I want my teddy. I'm frightened. It's a scary story. Don't worry. It has a happy ending. How do feelings happen? When we see, hear, or think things, our brains make us feel a certain way. Our feelings change when different things happen. Is it wrong to cry? No, you often feel better after a good cry. It also lets others see you're hurt or upset, and they can try to help. How many different feelings are there?
It's hard to say for sure. Some scientists think there are as many as 27. The four main ones are happiness, sadness, anger, and fear. You may also feel nervous, shy, lonely, confused, surprised, amazed, excited, and many other feelings. What makes us happy? We're happy when good things happen to us and when we think happy thoughts. Why are these animals happy? Follow me because it's sunny and I can play outside. Knock, knock because I'm visiting my friends. Because I'm going on an adventure. Why are you both laughing? We can't help it. It bubbles out when we're playing. Laughing shows others you're having fun together. Do you always smile when you're happy? No, you don't. I'm happy. I'm just concentrating too hard to smile. And sometimes you smile when you're not happy. I'm just putting on a brave face. Why don't we feel happy all the time? Because life's not perfect. Things go wrong and bad things happen. We all feel upset, worried, or angry at times, but hopefully not for long. What makes us sad? Bad stuff happening, getting hurt, something going wrong, or someone close to us dying. What's the matter? I fell over and cut myself. No one wants to play with me. Do tears always mean you're sad? No. You can try cry tears of happiness or because there's a fly in your eye. Are you feeling lonely? No, I just want some peace and quiet. Sometimes it feels good to be alone for a while. Will I ever feel happy again? Yes, we all feel sad at times. It can help to talk with someone you trust. There will be more happy times to come and you'll always have your memories. How can I cheer up my friends? Be there for him. Give him a chance to talk and maybe even a hug. You, you could suggest a fun activity to take his mind off of things. What makes us angry? Why are you all angry? We might get angry when we feel picked on, hurt by someone, frustrated, or that life isn't fair. I'm angry because you're hogging the swing. What's up with you? You've got a bigger slice of cake than me. It's not fair. I always get the blame. Well, you should have given me the bigger slice. How can you tell if someone is angry? They might stomp their feet, clench their fists, shout, turn red in the face, even hit someone. How should I cope with my anger? Talk to someone about why you're angry. Maybe they can help. Try taking slow breaths and counting to 10 first. Did I do something wrong? Probably not. Often someone's anger has more to do with their own feelings rather than anything you've done. Give them space. But if you think you might have hurt them, then just saying sorry can help. Why do we worry? We worry about stuff going wrong and what might happen next. How can you tell that I'm worried? You're quieter than usual. You're nibbling your nails and you've got worry lines on your forehead. What's the matter? I've broken my toy. I'm worried my mother will be annoyed. Can I hide my worries? Yes, but it won't make them go away. They may even get worse. It's better to talk to someone about what's worrying you. Do grown-ups worry too? Yes, grown-ups are big worriers. They should turn to the last page and read the flaps there. 
What makes us scared? Spooky shadows, sudden noises, scary stories, all sorts. What happens when you're scared? You might feel a shiver down your spine, butterflies in your tummy, or your teeth might ch chatter. Are you scared of me? Is the dark scary? I don't think so. Many of us do find the dark scary. We're scared of what we can't see. It's sensible to be sensible to be careful, but there's usually nothing to worry about. If you're really scared of one thing, it's called a phobia. Dealing with our feelings. It's normal to feel, normal to feel sad, worried, or angry at times. Here are some ideas for how to cope with your feelings. How can I stop feeling scared? Tell someone what's scaring you. I saw a monster in the water. Sometimes the scary thing can be taken away. Other times you might realize it wasn't scary after all. Don't worry, it was only a log. How can I cheer up? Think of something else and try to smile. Even the action of smiling can make you feel happier. Who can I talk to? Choose a grown-up you can trust. It could be someone at home or a teacher at school. Maybe you could call a grandparent or uncle. I'm keeping my hands busy. It helps calm me down. What are these animals doing to make them feel better? I'm having an early night. I always feel better after a good sleep. I'm doing yoga and taking deep breaths. It helps me to relax and clears my mind. I'm playing outside. Fresh air and exercise make me feel happy. I'm drawing a picture of my worries. They don't seem so bad when they're on paper. The end. Awesome. <clears throat> so now we're on to step three, and it's how to handle those big feelings. So really, when it comes down to it, behavior is communication. If you really think about that, all behavior is a form of communication. So this on this slide here, you see it says timeouts do not help children learn to regulate their emotions or help them learn moral values like right from wrong. So, you know, if you are anything like me, um, you know, you may have grown up being in timeout at times or using timeout with your children, um, but we're gonna discuss really why time in is better than timeout and how to handle those big feelings. So big emotions are actually usually what leads up to big, to a timeout, excuse me. Um, things like anger, frustration, fear, that can lead to a behavior that puts a child in timeout. But in timeout, really what we're doing is we're isolating the child to be alone at a young age with their emotions and their feelings. And kids don't learn very much from that. Um, actually, it's quite the opposite. They can learn that what they felt um, is actually wrong or their big emotion was wrong to have, um, which is counterproductive to emotional development. You can click ahead then, Ms. Tozer, thank you. All right, so in a minute, we're gonna watch um, a, we're actually gonna watch two quick videos, but um, it's really what time in can look like. Um, but just so you know that time in should be kind of a safe space in your house. They call it a calm down corner in this. Um, this calm down corner, I'll be honest, is a little like elaborate and you're gonna see some things there that, you know, you may have access to um, other things you may not, and that's okay. Um, you're actually going to get part of what they use um, for participating in this webinar tonight. That's why we needed your names and your child's name in the chat because we're gonna be able to share out some materials with you, which we're really excited about. Um, but really your calm down space or your time in space can be very, very simple. Um, it's just an area that is a safe space that has some activities that your child can do independently, um, quietly, and take a minute 
to get themselves together. So we're gonna watch this video and then we're gonna come back and talk a little bit about it and then watch our second video. How do you respond in ways that model better behavior when you are in the eye of the storm with a toddler? This information will change your life. It's going to improve your relationship with your children and it's going to help you foster emotional intelligence in both yourself and your child. We're going to talk about time ins and the importance of emotional intelligence. Research and science continually point to the benefits of positive discipline strategies, but often parents struggle to implement these strategies into their everyday lives. Suzanne created a collection of evidence-based tools and toys that make connection a habit in homes and schools alike. These tools teach emotional intelligence and self-control through play and positive discipline. This is so important because a child's emotional intelligence level can actually predict their mental health status as adults. It will define their relationships both with themselves and with others. So what is emotional intelligence and how will it benefit your child? The phrase emotional intelligence describes a child's ability to recognize their feelings, understand where those feelings come from, and respond to them in an appropriate way. Time ins. What are they and how do they work to turn misbehavior into learning opportunities? First of all, a time in is not a time out. It means if your child gets mad at their sibling for knocking over their tower and they respond by hitting them, you don't send them to be alone with their sadness in the corner with no way of working through what happened. You calmly but firmly ask them to go to their calming corner. And here's where we have a cozy place to sit, a little table for doing desk work like coloring or working on a puzzle. We also have these really cool posters from Generation Mindful and these have been invaluable for fostering communication. I start by setting a timer and giving my child 30 seconds or so to settle in. Then I come over and ask what happened, allowing my child to give their side of the story without interruption or judgment. I then might say something like, wow, you were working hard on that tower. That must have been really frustrating when your brother knocked it over. How are you feeling right now? And I will echo back what they say. You are feeling angry. It's okay to feel angry. You are in control of your feelings and you know what they are, but hitting is never okay, even when we're angry. Let's brainstorm some ways that can actually help with your anger. Would you like to pick something from our list or our basket? And then I allow my child to pick one or two things that they think will help them and I give them time to work through the puzzle or coloring book on their own. And then I will ask, are you feeling better? and I give them an opportunity to respond. This whole process can be done in a matter of minutes and it's usually not a power struggle because my kids like to do it. They enjoy practicing these skills and they like taking charge of their bodies and their minds. I also wanted to note that it's not always so hands-on. My daughter knows the routine now, so for minor issues or moments when she just needs a reset, she'll often place herself in the time and space and just work through the steps on her own, calling out to me if she needs anything like a glass of water, a hug, etc. We also visit time ends during times when we aren't experiencing a high stress emotion. This space is a cozy part of our home, a great place to connect with my kids and chat about their feelings and experiences, to connect in a deeper way and work on their emotional well-being all at the same time. Once again, the point of discipline is not to shame or blame your child or label them as bad. It is to teach them a better way to respond in the future. If the whole goal is to stave off unwanted behaviors, we have to give our kids the tools for doing better. We are all learning and we're all growing and life is new to your kids. Parenting may be new to you. We all have a shared goal of raising kind and healthy humans and I can assure you that this is a research proven way to attain that goal and live a healthier, happier life. Yeah, so um, it really does help your child develop in a healthy way and it really does help open the communication between yourself and your child about their feelings, um, about what may have frustrated them, um, and it makes them feel safer. Uh, there's another video that, quick, that we want to show you um, that is a little girl who is using her time out, and she's a toddler. Um, she's using her time in corner, excuse me, calm down corner, and just watch for this and we'll talk after. Do you think it's Red Bear? Is it? Ah! Red Bear, your favorite. Let's read the words. Tiptoes. I'm going to put it in my tiptoes and hold it so you can read it. Oh, thank you. It says, I am safe and secure. Can you show me what it looks like when you feel safe? <laughs> oh, you feel safe right now? <laughs> that's, that's what I, I lay down and be safe in my bed. And some 
Sometimes when I'm feeling safe in my bed, I always feel a little scared and I'm scared a lot. And I, and I think there's a ghost. <laughs> oh, and then you don't feel very safe and secure. And then, I, and, and then I just went out of my bed and I, and I get daddy or you in the middle of the night and, and get you and, 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 and tell you to stay and stay in my room and then I feel happy again. Strategies help when you're not feeling so safe. So if you're if you're in your bed and you're feeling really scared and not safe, what is the best calming strategy? Can you choose one? To hug something. Oh, that's a great choice. What's your favorite thing to hug? My stuffed animals and my toys and my mommy and daddy and even my bear. <laughs> I'm So as you can see this little one, she has been using her um, time in area to talk about another strong feeling, which is fear when your child is, you know, maybe going to bed at night and doesn't want to be by themselves. Um, she had some really good strategies. She knows that she can talk to mom and dad, but she also knows that she can squeeze her bear or her toy or stuffed animals, and that helps her calm down. Um, all of that being said, um, you know, I'm sure some of you are thinking, but you know, if my son just smacked my daughter and um, hit her because he was frustrated, and now we've talked about being frustrated, and that's great, but where's the consequence? And you know, time in. Um, doesn't believe in ignoring inappropriate behaviors at all, um, but the focus is switched. There's just a focus switch in what we're paying attention to. So we deal with the feeling first in a really healthy way and the consequences after. And I will say that when we deal with the feeling first and the consequence a little bit later or, or a little while on, your child is more receptive because their emotions aren't heightened to begin with. So they're more ready to listen to what their consequence may be. Um, so that consequence can be like the loss of a preferred toy or maybe some tech time, maybe an extra chore. And they may, when you're talking to them about it, they may feel frustrated or angry again. But in that calm down corner is where you can discuss that feeling and identify that motion, emotion saying, you know what, I see that when I told you you're going to lose some iPad time, that made you feel frustrated or that made you feel angry and deal with that in the calm down space. So one thing we wanted to mention is that this is only one idea on how to help your child. And as we said before, we are parents ourselves and in different stages of the game, and we're learning as we go also what works best. Like this strategy might work for Christine and it might not work for me as well. So I might have to come up with a creative way to use it or something totally different. So Christine is going to explain um, the if then cards and that process. And during that time, if you would like to share something as experts in your own children's lives and your parenting journeys, if you'd like to share anything in the Q&A portion, something that works really well that you've tried in your home for all of us to learn from, um, feel free to do that and we will re revisit it after Christine explains the if then cards, which you will be receiving. Yeah, so um, this is, you know, what they like, but I have them in front of me as well. And I wanna show you tonight how you can use these in your calm down space, in your time in corner. Um, so you're gonna all get as um, Ms. Tozer said, you're getting a, a set of these and they're really, really valuable resources. Um, I really like using them and I'd like to show you a few tips and tricks um, about using them, some things that I found out along the way. So the first thing that you're actually going to get, and I hope you can see this okay, I do apologize, um, but again, you're going to get this and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either one of us when you get your materials and we'll be happy to walk you through it again. But the first thing you're gonna get is an activity mat. And this mat will begin to help your child learn from their powerful, or learn about their powerful emotions, okay? So this says, what can I do at the top? There are four steps. Um, in each of these, we're gonna walk through what 
this looks like. So step one is I feel, and you're actually going to get several, um, you're gonna get four sets of cards. And um, two are feelings cards, feelings and emotions cards, two different sets. They look very, very much the same. Um, you're gonna get a doing cards, um, so what to do. And then finally, just a simple answer to a question of am I feeling better or not? So let's walk through that and as we do it, I'm gonna show you what I've done. So I actually put my cards into individual bags. In these bags, I have it labeled with number one, which goes along with the first step here. And then on the back of the card, I also have ones on all of those cards. Um, I also put Velcro on them, and I'll show you in a second why that helps. So your first set of emotions cards, um, you're gonna get, you may talk to your child about feeling silly or scared, or they would look like they're sad or frustrated. So as Ms. Tozer said, if your child knocks down, if your child um, hits a sibling because their block tower was knocked down, then they may feel frustrated. And you talk to them about that and you say, I feel you look like you're frustrated or they hopefully will, when using this, start to begin to use these themselves, but they're gonna need your help at first. And I feel frustrated. And this is where that Velcro helps because it stays on there and doesn't lead to further frustration. So I feel frustrated. The next is the I can part. So what can you do when you're frustrated? When we reference back to that video, you remember that um, the mom in that video was had several things set up. She had a nice little table there, but she also had just a box of books. She had some stuffed animals. She had a coloring book. So there's a whole bunch of these. I'm just gonna show you a couple, but again, these are in my number two bag, right? So for example, do a puzzle, take three deep breaths, take a drink of water, count to 10, read a book, draw, or hug a stuffed animal. So if your child is feeling really frustrated, they may choose to draw a picture or hug a stuffed animal. So you wanna put two on there, two choices. That's something that you can do when you're feeling frustrated, great. And let your child do that for a few minutes. And you can watch and see if you see them calming down or you know, give them some space, but keep an eye on. And then you go to step three, which are the same types of feelings cards as step one, but there is a whole other set. So your child can choose from the number three bag that after doing the activities, how are they feeling? Are they still feeling angry? Are they relaxed? Are they feeling proud? Or are they feeling calm? So let's say your child is feeling calm. That's great. But you wanna ask them, am I feeling better? Because if they're calm, then maybe they're better, but maybe they're not. So there are, step four, there's only three choices. So you ask them, are you feeling better? Yes, I am. No, I'm not, or a little. If your child answers no, then you can put it on there and maybe they choose a different activity to go back to. They go back and they do one of these two or they change out a card and put something different on. But ideally, after a little time, yes, they're feeling better. And that's when you can address talking about the action and the consequence that they may have. But it really does foster a better rapport between you and your child. It begins to teach them the language that they need to name their emotions. And most importantly, that none of their feelings are wrong. So as we mentioned, you will be getting a set of those cards, but there is one more step in this process that is probably the most important step in the entire process and one that we often forget, you know, we've spoken about this amongst ourselves. A lot of the advice we are about to give you, we should be taking oftentimes as well. So this is a reminder for us, um, taking care of yourself. The whole cliche, like remember if you're on a plane, you put your oxygen mask on first before you can help anybody else. 
it's so true with parenting. Um, when I am feeling more in control of my own emotions and like I've had sleep or I've taken a shower that day, I'm probably a lot more pleasant for my kids to be around. And I oftentimes find myself, you know, getting frustrated at times. And it's more a frustration that I should have been doing something to take care of me before I was trying to then deal with this big feeling or big behavior that was coming from them. Um, so some, a lot of this is advice that I was given. I spent um, several years of my, my youngsters' lives um, single parenting them, coming home from school and dealing with the after school hustle and bustle, me being tired, me being hungry, they're hungry, they're tired, having to get dinner ready, having to bathe them, wanting to get them in bed at a certain time because they know they need a certain amount of sleep. And a lot of this is advice that I've gotten from either older and wiser parents, um, professionals, and just from my own searching for trying to make this process better for myself. Um, the first is eat dinner first or with your kids, which I know sounds a little bit um, strange, but my kids, and I keep telling them when my son turns five, they're not getting a separate meal. They're very picky and they eat pasta and chicken nuggets as one of their staples with like whatever fruit or the one vegetable they will both eat, which is carrots um, that they like. So I'm usually making that before I'm making something more grown up for myself. Um, and what I would do is I would find that I was you know, tired and hungry and I would make their food and then they'd ask me for a million things or spill something and I'd never be able to like really get to make myself something or eat something. And someone had told me like, you need to eat, make your food first and eat it with them or eat, you know, eat before you sit down and feed them because you are not taking care of you. And then you're just, your frustration tolerance is going down. Um, same with showering. I feel like a lot of times you feel like, oh, like get all the, get the kids settled, then take care of the things I need to do, like making lunches or straightening up or taking a shower. Um, waiting to do that so they're settled and everyone is settled is kind of sometimes like waiting way too late. And then it's like, you feel like you've maybe exercised or been at work and you're still feeling like not the best version of yourself because you couldn't even do something like take a shower. Um, so prioritize doing little things like that and they can go a long way. Um, try not to set high standards. I know social media, it affects, it affects kids, it affects parents. Um, seeing the things like on Pinterest, the cute like birthday ideas or what other people are doing with their kids. Um, don't set those high standards. Like oftentimes we hear from kids and some of the memories that like we hear about from other adults that we talk to are things as simple as like, making Friday fun food Friday. You don't need to go to a restaurant, but maybe you like um, have breakfast for dinner or you have um, hot dogs cut up and wrapped up in like little mini buns and they get to dip it in whatever sauce they want. Like just making it exciting, letting them have soda and eat at a table in the living room on a Friday night and calling it a party. You know, like it doesn't have to involve money. It doesn't have to involve going out, especially now during COVID, but just like little things like they think are like, trust me, we hear about them, especially even me in the one to eight building. Like we hear about these like awesome things that happen over the weekend. And oftentimes it might not be that like trip you took. It might be like when you sat on the floor with them and you all ate popcorn watching a movie, which you don't usually do. And that was something out of the ordinary that you all got to sit and eat popcorn and watch a movie and they stayed up at 15 more minutes, not on a school night though. Um, and then find something you can do every day to reset or give yourself a break. Um, there is an article here that we're going to share with you with the resources um, for depending on how much time you have. If you have one minute, if like things you can do, um, laugh, hug someone, drink a glass of water. If you have five minutes, um, if you have 10, all the way up to an hour, writing in a journal, doing your nails, make yourself a meal. Um, sometimes cleaning up does help you feel better. So I get it if like, you know, you wanna take that time to declutter, um, maybe declutter by getting rid of some of their toys that drive you crazy or whatever you wanna do. Um, but it gives you all these ideas 
and we will definitely share that with you as well in the resource page that you're going to get. And then another important thing that we often forget, and as my reminder, I'm wearing it tonight, um, try and see yourselves through the eyes of your, chi your child who may have just come home from school with this, a necklace made out of either pasta or string and beads that don't, that are uneven and don't go together and think that it is the best thing in the world because their, their mommy or their daddy is going to wear it or their grandparent or whoever's taking care of them is going to have it and know it's from them. So you are the best person in the world to that child. And a lot of times we feel like we're failing and making mistakes more than we realize how much they adore us. So try and think about what that child that you're getting stressed out over and they're having big feelings left and right and you want to bang your head against the wall that remember like they see you as perfect and amazing and try and give yourself some credit because you helped with that piece as well. So we just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we know your time is valuable. It's a tough time of night. <laughs> um, so we really appreciate the fact that you chose to spend it with us. We hope that you got something out of tonight. Um, again, you are your expert in your child. Um, these are some suggestions uh, and um, you know some ideas that you can use. You can use all of them. You can use part of them. Take bits and pieces. Um, but we will stay on for a few more minutes to address any questions. You can put them in the Q and A if you should have any. Uh, and please remember that important step. If you haven't done so already, sign into the chat with your name and your child's name and the school they attend. And that way we can make sure that we can get these resources to you. Thank you so much. Thank we you. Really appreciate your time.